All right, everybody, thank you for joining me today where my solemn duty is to share with you the latest presentation I've put together with regard to what seems to be one of my favorite topics or the favorite topics that people want to hear about from me, which, of course, is the Randall Cycle. What is it that you need to know? Uh, this is the February 2023 version. I've, I've put together several versions of this presentation over the years, as you know. So this is the latest, most um, up-to-date version. So you're welcome. Anyway, let's crack on with that without too much further ado, shall we? All righty. So uh, the first thing I wanted to say was it's very, very important. I think that people don't spend quite so much energy overcomplicating this thing. There are a lot of uh, commentators running around on the interwebs making all sorts of deep dives, they call it, into the actual physiology underpinning this Randall cycle, how it works in their mind, how they've interpreted it. Um, a lot of those people come from the repeat school of thinking, um, of which I am not a fan remotely, but that's for another day. And so at the end of this presentation, I will run through some of the errors of interpretation that have been promulgated by people in, in that community or sub-community, if you like, uh, at the end. In the meantime, I want you to sit back, relax, and yeah, take this thing at face value. This, this doesn't need to be overcomplicated. So what I'm going to do is present it to you in the most parsimonious fashion that I can muster, the most simple fashion I can muster. And hopefully it will be something that will go up your flagpole, as it were. <laughs> okay, so here we go. Facts. Basic facts about the Randall cycle. Fact number one, that it is in fact not a cycle. <laughs> in the typical way that a biological cycle is thought about, this would be something like the TCA cycle, otherwise known as the Krebs cycle, otherwise known as the tricarboxylic acid cycle, uh, otherwise known as the citric acid cycle, for example, which we'll talk about actually during this presentation uh, as, we, as we get going with it. That's a cycle because it's a series of um, metabolic chemical reactions that start at a given point and end at that same point and it drives itself around depending on substrate availability availability and that kind of stuff. Um, the Randall cycle is no such thing. It's not a cycle, so I don't know really why it's called a cycle. The Randall cycle is um, a set of metabolic componentry, if you want to think of it that way. Bits of metabolic machinery, if you like to think about it that way. It is a physical thing. There are actual components of your metabolic systems your control systems inside each and every one of the several trillion, that's with a T, trillion cells in your body that interact with each other in a certain way so as to ensure the functioning in the most conducive fashion, really, of your cells. And these various bits of, of machinery are very much like sliders faders on a on an audio board or or um, variable resistors in an electrical circuit analogy they're not on off switches they are up and down sliders if you like to think of them that way so um, that's some basic background there the components the bits of machinery if you like that i'm talking about are fatty acids and carbohydrates as fuel sources for so-called energy production in the cells. The stuff that we use to chemically release some Gibbs free energy, which is then immediately encapsulated by a coupled um, chemical reaction, which will produce ATP for use later in biological process, basically. The energy storage um, form, I guess, within the cells. So fats and carbohydrates. Sure, other things can be used for energy, but by far the most two common are fats and carbohydrates are what usually get oxidized by cells to produce ATP. Okay. A B, 
various transmembrane transporter proteins. These are proteins that basically go from one side of the membrane to the other, and they have a channel or a series of channels, depending on their particular structure. And these proteins either allow or disallow the passage of various chemical substances in either direction into the cell, out of the cell, from the cell fluid to the mitochondria, or from the mitochondria to the cell fluid, for example. All of these proteins, these transmembrane proteins, are able to be upwardly and downwardly controlled by those faders so that they are more or less effective at allowing that substance to pass that protein in that direction and thus allowing it to move from one part of a cell to another part of the cell. Okay, so the maximum is free transit according to concentration gradients, no resistance to flow at all, and the maximum is completely shut, can't go through, blocked, and anywhere in between is a possible setting. All right, so that's B. C, various different enzymes within your metabolic um, tree, if you like, or your, or your metabolic pathways. And what these enzymes do is catalyze various reactions that turn one thing into the next thing, or in the case of many enzymes, or the reverse reaction. There are a number of reactions in the metabolic pathway that are unidirectional, will only go one way but most of them can be reversed so that the, uh, the metabolic pathway can run in either direction, forward or backward, okay? But if you like to think of the forward and backward directions to give you some idea of that. So what are those enzymes doing? They are acting to increase or decrease the forces of various things on the various valves, those proteins that are designed to move those various particular substances one way or the other across those gateways, those valves, if you like, those transmembrane proteins. All right, good. D, we're up to D here, there it is. Various metabolic intermediaries, which act as the force carriers to and between the various enzymes. So the actual substances, the things that are forcing or, or attempting to force against those, those valves. Okay. That's really, that's really all the, the Randall cycle is. It's machinery that exists within the cell cytosol and on the cell membranes and on the uh, inner and outer membranes of the mitochondria. All right, so that's, what the, that's where the components, the, the effective components of the Randall cycle are, and that is where they act. Why does the Randall cycle exist? Okay, it exists solely because it has survived 13.8 thousand million years of evolution. It is encoded for in your very genetic structure. That is the thing that gives the instructions for the body to synthesize and make the various proteins that make the thing up. And it exists for the purpose of fuel management and overridingly the safety of the cell from damage that it would otherwise suffer were the fuel sources not controlled adequately uh, for reasons I'll talk about very soon. So as I said, this is this Randall cycle is the result of billions, billions of years of evolution, and it is absolutely miraculous. It's an incredible piece of kit. It does exactly what it should do. It works perfectly and it causes things to occur in such a way as to moderate the fuel selection of cells and to protect them from damage. So it's a fantastic thing, not a negative thing. It's there for a reason and that's basically what it is. So we could actually stop this presentation there. If you didn't want any further detail, I could just say to you, well, number one, the Randall cycle is not a cycle. It's a series of faders. It has various components. That's what they are, A, B, C, and D. 
Uh, it's there to look after your fuel selection in your cells and to protect those cells from damage that they would suffer were the fuel sources not controlled. Cool. If that's all you wanted today, you've got it. There you go. You're welcome. See you next time. For those of you that want some detail, stick around because I'll give you a little bit more. Here it comes. Are you ready? All right. The basic operational principle, how does this thing work? How does it do what it does to select fuel and to protect the cell from damage? Well, here it is. If there is carbohydrate in your bloodstream, that carbohydrate will enter the cells, providing there is insulin also in your blood. In other words, providing you're not a type 1 diabetic, for example. And, or indeed, if you are a type 1 diabetic and you've taken exogenous insulin in the form of injecting that in, fine, that'll work too. In that case, the carbohydrate will enter the cells and it will be oxidized by those cells, by the mitochondria in those cells, for energy, in other words, to produce ATP. And that will occur, no problem, as long as the energy drain by the mitochondria, the need to produce energy, is sufficient to keep the level of carbs in the cell fluid from starting to pull, from starting to build up. Okay, no problem. Factors that might cause carbohydrate to begin to pull or to, or to build up in its concentration within the cell fluid. Number one, you might have a very high level of blood glucose and insulin. That would cause the level of sugar in the cell to build up above the level that it's being drained, if you like, by the mitochondria using it up to produce energy. That might do it. Another way it can happen is you have the carb-fat-fuel mix selector, which is inherently part of the, the Randall cycle, and in fact its entire purpose really. That fuel selector might be pushed hard towards the use of fat, and the use of carbohydrate might be, to all intents and purposes, severely discouraged or indeed locked out at the maximum setting. Okay, so that might be happening. What is the thing that pushes that slider towards fat use? Well, it's a very high supply of fat in the blood and in the cell fluid. That's what does it. Okay. Um, or let's say you're inactive. You're not doing much. You're not exercising. You're a couch potato. You're sitting around. In that case, there's less absolute energy use. Therefore, there would be less absolute carbohydrate use, all else being equal. And then if the carbohydrate supply in the blood is high, because let's say you've eaten a meal rich in carbohydrate, then, hello Randall cycle, it will lock that carb out. Um, why does that happen, by the way? Well, it's real simple. Excess carbohydrate in the cell fluid of any cell will cause glycative damage to the structures in that cell that glucose will bind chemically to the proteins, to the fats, etc., and chemically alter it in such a way as to be damaging. That is not a good thing. You do not want that to be happening. Glycative damage is very, very serious. And as such, if sugar was allowed to enter the cell according to its concentration gradient, and there was no control on the entry of that carbohydrate, then it would just pour into the cell every single time you eat a meal that contains any carbohydrate to speak of at all. And that would damage your cells every single time. So there has to be a way of keeping that sugar outside the cells in the blood so that it's only allowed to enter when it's needed. That's what the Randall cycle is in a nutshell. All right? So that's basically. Um, that concept, principle number one. So, as long as energy draw is sufficient to keep the carbohydrate concentration from raising in the cell, then the cell will quite happily allow sugar to enter under the instruction of insulin, no problem. Fine. As soon as you have any significant amount of fat available for use, that will be used and that will lock out sugar. Or if you're inactive, that will start to tend to start locking out the sugar as well. Okay, cool.
Let's move on to operational, basic operational principle number two. Here it is. Fat will enter cells and will be oxidized for energy as long as the energy drain is sufficient to keep that fat from pooling in the cell. Factors that might cause fat to begin to pool in cells. Maybe you have an excessively high blood fat level. How would that happen? Well, you've eaten an excessive amount of fat, or you've eaten some carbohydrate, which your body cannot use because the Randall cycle is locking it out, so it goes back to the liver and gets transmuted into fat. Or there's a lot of fat in your blood because you've been fasting for a bit. Those kind of things. When there's fat to be used, the fat will be used and the sugar will be spared, locked out. Um, as we evolved over at least the last 350,000 years, more like the last four and a half million probably, carbohydrate was actually not particularly available to humans. We couldn't get it. There wasn't much to be had. And as such, when we could get it, well, it was kept in reserve a bit. And so fat will always go through first, assuming that um, the level of carbohydrate isn't excessive, which we'll get to soon. So another thing that can cause the fat to go through, other than just a lot of it in the bloodstream, is that the fuel selector is pushed hard towards carb. Sorry, that would make the fat build up in the cell. If it's pushed hard towards carb by a, a very high level of carbohydrate, then the fat will be locked out. Okay, we'll get to details on how that happens in a minute. Uh, in the case where fat begins to pull, then the series of safety valves progressively slide shut and lock out carbohydrate entry to the cell. For the same reason as we don't want carb pushing its way through into the cell under its own concentration gradient, we also don't want carb pouring into that cell and poisoning that cell when we are hard into fat use. So it gets locked out. That's the other way the Randall cycle will lock out the carbs. Great. So, what is the effect of the combined activities number one and number two that I've just outlined? Okay, if you are oxidizing fat because there's a lot of fat available to be oxidized, that will attenuate carb oxidation and it will cause the carb to be progressively more and more locked out, harder and harder, the more fat pours through the cell. Or, more accurately than uh, locked out, you'd call it discouraged, attenuated, toned down, something like that. The actual effect on the carbohydrate is determined by the level of fat. A very high level of fat will lock carb out completely. A moderate level of fat will lock out carb somewhat, and a very low to no level of fat in the blood will mean that carb can pour through according to its concentration gradient, so long as it doesn't start to pull in the cell. Cool. As the fat level drops, if it's been high, then those sliding effects are reversed, although it does take some time for a cell to change its metabolic direction and pull those faders back and get it sorted. So there is a lag time, is what I'm saying. Um, and then the carb will start to pour through once the fat's all used up, pretty much, or, or nearly all used up. Okay. Um, Further to that, if, if carbohydrate levels exceed the ability to oxidize it at that time, then the, the carb will lock itself out, basically, in order to protect the cell from, from glycative damage. Um, so the take home of all of that is, if you have an all-fat diet with no carbohydrates in it at all, the Randall cycle will not be an issue. It will not be a problem. It'll do exactly what it should do, and that'll be fine. No issues at all. If you consume a diet that's all carbohydrate, the same is true. You will not have any Randall cycle issues until your blood glucose spikes, which it will every single time you eat. So you will still have Randall cycle issues on an all carb diet, and it will last for several hours postprandially every time after you've eaten carbohydrate, at least, sometimes longer. If you have a mixed diet which contains both fats and carbohydrates, that is an absolute disaster metabolically. 
that will cause the strongest, longest lasting cross inhibition of fat locking out carb and carb locking out fat at the same time. And that will lead to a situation of inflammation and a tendency to gain body fat, as well as to suffer all those secondary effects of inflammation, which are heart disease, atherosclerosis, type 2 diabetes, tending towards type 1 diabetes, chronic inflammatory issues such as immune system activations that you don't want, um, most forms of dementia, most forms of cancer, all the big killers. So the last thing in the world you want to do is consume a diet which contains a significant amount of both fat and carbohydrate that will absolutely reduce your health span and almost certainly reduce your life span as well. If you get nothing else from this presentation, please understand that. You must not mix carbohydrates and fats in your diet. That leaves you with two choices. An all-carbohydrate protein diet or an all-fat protein diet, one of which will supply you with all the nutrient you require for robust health and longevity, and one of which will leave you destitute of such nutrient and will leave you with your health falling to bits anyway within probably three to five years. So actually, you've only got one choice. Carnivore, no plants, no carbohydrates, no fruit, none of it. There we go. And this is the biological metabolic reasoning for that argument. And anyone who tells you otherwise does not understand this. Right, so let's move on. Now, I just need to hit a couple of buttons to make that picture more visible for you. There it is. What we're looking at here on the left-hand side is that fat-predominant situation where you have a lot of fatty acids pouring into the cell. The blue band at the top of the diagram is your bloodstream. The tan-colored middle zone of this is the intercellular fluid, the cell cytosol. And at the bottom of the screen in the light green color is the fluid inside the mitochondria where the energy production is taking place. So on the left, we have the fat predominant situation where a lot of LCFA, which stands for long chain fatty acids, are transported into the cell according to their concentration gradient from the blood using a protein transporter called CD36 which you will find, which you will find there, there it is, LCFA on the CD36. Then it will travel through the cell cytosol and it picks up a coenzyme A through a series of reactions there in the cell cytosol and that transmutes it into long chain fatty acyl coenzyme A which then is the thing that is transported by the CPT1 transporter into the mitochondrial space where beta oxidation is a process that that's broken down to acetyl coenzyme A, which is thought of as the first intermediary of the tricarboxylic acid cycle, which I spoke about earlier, otherwise known as the Krebs cycle, the TCA cycle, and all those other things. In the Krebs cycle, um, the, the second intermediary, if you like to think of it that way, is a thing called citrate. And if citrate builds up in concentration, it starts to pour back from the mitochondria into the cell cytosol, and it starts to build up in there. When that occurs, citrate will allosterically bind to the phosphofructokinase number one enzyme, which is here, and the GLUT4, which is here on the cell membrane. When that allosteric inhibition occurs, what that means is that citrate chemically binds to that protein, and in so doing, it stops that protein from transporting that substance. It blocks that pathway, basically, which is what these double lines here mean. They mean this pathway is blocked at that point. It's also blocked at that point. So the more fat that pours through here, the more citrate builds up here, and I'll tell you why that is in a minute. 
that means the more citrate pours back out here, and that actually causes the blockade of the um, of the whole left hand side of that chart where glucose would be coming through were it allowed to. It's not. It's being to, that's the slider being turned down on that, and so that's what we've got. On the right hand side of this chart, we have the carb predominant situation, where glucose in the blood is high, insulin in the blood is high, and the insulin is binding to the GLUT4 transporter, telling it to transport glucose into the cell. By the way, it's the citrate binding to that that stops the insulin from binding to it and blocks it out at the GLUT4 on the, on the very hard left. In this case, that's not happening. So the GLUT4 can transport the glucose into the cell and the PFK1 and 2 enzymes are free to do their thing. And then, hey presto, we get pyruvate. And pyruvate is transported into the mitochondria where pyruvate dehydrogenase complex breaks that down to the exact same acetyl coenzyme A as we have over here. And thus that produces some citrate, but not as much as the fat predominant situation. Um, but as such, the citrate will then enter into the cell cytosol, exactly as it did in the left-hand situation. And then another enzyme, which is blocked in the left-hand pathway, is free to act, thus meaning that the citrate picks up an acetyl coenzyme A, or is transmuted into acetyl coenzyme A. And then another um, transmutation occurs here at ACC, which produces a substance called melanol coenzyme A, which then blocks out the CPT1 transporter and stops fatty acid from entering the mitochondria, and instead directs that fat to triglyceride formation instead. So that's pretty, pretty straightforward. So a lot of people think that this is an either-or situation. Either fat is predominant and the left-hand thing is happening, or carb is predominant and the right-hand thing is happening. What people don't seem to understand is that both of these are sliding scales, depending on how much predominance of fat there is or how much carb predominance there is. Any mixture to speak of, of carb and fat, will cause some cross-inhibition of both meaning everything is locked out, and that is what leads to the problem. So the level of cytosolic citrate is the thing that really determines the fuel source preference on the left, and it does that by blocking out the GLUT4 and the PFK1. On the left, the mitochondrial citrate efflux into the cytosol, the cell fluid, is higher because the citrate flux through the Krebs cycle or TCA cycle is discouraged, which I'll cover in the next slide. And the melanol coenzyme step that would drain that citrate away, as in it does on the right-hand side, that is blocked because there is a substance called AMP kinase on the left which blocks it, and AMP kinase is deactivated on the right-hand side through a series of, of other reactions basically so that's pretty much how that works in practice all right so hopefully that's as clear as mud if not stick with me once we get below the level that we've just looked at we're looking at the citric the citric acid cycle that i've been talking about the tca cycle whatever else so what we can see is that at the top up here we have acetyl coenzyme A, which is the same thing as the acetyl coenzyme A that we looked at in the chart that we've just seen. The first intermediary, if you like. That can be provided by pyruvate up here, as in the left hand side of the last chart, or it can be provided by beta oxidation, i.e., the right hand side of the last chart. Doesn't matter, it's the same acetyl coenzyme A. Pyruvate will discourage beta oxidation. Beta oxidation will discourage pyruvate production, pretty much. Okay. So when we get down to the B, to the citric acid cycle level, what we need to understand is it's the citrate building up in concentration and pouring back into the cell cytosol that's causing the Randall cycle to do its thing. 
And we need to understand why the citrate would build up, because if this is a cycle where concentration gradients drive the thing in a clockwise direction, as it is, why would citrate build up just because you're adding citrate? If you add citrate, that should just drive the cycle to run more rapidly, and the citrate concentration should actually remain fairly stable. It's Le Chatelier's principle in action, basically. Okay, well, here's the answer. When you undertake beta oxidation, beta oxidation as one of its activities produces a substance called FADH2, which is an analog or a different version of the NADH. FADH2 tends to they call it, again, um, compete with or, or cross-inhibit the draining of NADH by the electron transport chain, which is the next, uh, the next slide. And as such, that actually deactivates the aconitase enzyme here, thus blockading the forward clockwise action of the citric acid cycle from citrate to, to de-isocitrate. And as such, you think, well, that shuts down the Krebs cycle and would cause you to die. So that can't be right. And that's the thing that most of these uh, people that make errors about this don't understand either. It, the, the citric acid cycle is not a cycle as shown by most people as just the, the outside circle. There is a situation over here, which I will highlight thusly, where oxaloacetate, oxaloacetate can interact with aspartate and glutamate is the production that comes out of that, as well as alpha-ketoglutarate. In other words, it's a shortcut that steps straight past citrate, cis-aconitate, and de-isocitrate and forms alpha-ketoglutarate directly from oxaloacetate. Thus, meaning you can continue to live. So it's the fat oxidation that keeps the citrate high, causes the citrate to pour back into the cell cytosol and causes the deactivation of the sugar pathway, the sugar entry into the cell. Fantastic. Good stuff. Or, or downward regulates it on a sliding scale of no inhibition through to full inhibition in very severe circumstances. All right, so that's basically the take-home message of all of that. We'll come back to this slide a little bit later on. Um, not too much later on, because there's not much left, to be fair. But we will come back to that slide to make a few points um, further clear, hopefully. Let's look at the electron transport chain, which is the final step, if you like, in the journey of carbs and of fats to energy production. In the inner mitochondrial membrane, there are some transmembrane proteins, which you will see here in red color. They are called complex 1, complex 2, coenzyme Q10, which is just shown as Q here on this diagram. There, there is Q. Um, complex 3, there's another one called cytochrome C, and then finally complex 4. What does those complexes, those proteins, collectively do? They collectively um, accept hydrogen atoms from NADH and from FADH2, and they separate the hydrogen atoms into protons plus electrons, and they carry the electrons if you like, nominally on one side of the membrane and protons on the other, which is why these green arrows are showing the protons being pumped across and the electrons being maintained really within those cytochromes, those different pigments, those different proteins there, 1, 2, Q, 3, and 4. Such that at the end of the process, you have a number of free electrons, which can be donated back to this blue protein here, which is your ATP synthase. 
Your increased concentration of H pluses on that side of the membrane are allowed to travel through that, and that's the motor force that causes the production of ATP from ADP plus inorganic phosphate down here. Great. So that's the process in a nut shell. So the electron transport chain doesn't care so much where the hydrogens come from, except that there is something to watch here, and that is that FADH2, which we've spoken about already as coming from beta oxidation of fat, that doesn't join this chain at the number one protein. This joins at the number two protein. And then the coenzyme Q10, which is just called Q on this chart, that moves between one and two and three and two and one and three. And it shuttles the electrons from one to two to three or from two to three as the case may be. If there is a huge amount relative to the NAD input, if there's a huge amount of FAD input, then the coenzyme Q10 can get nominally gummed up, if you like, with H, H plus and E minus, really. And it can start to push back against the NADH being cleared here at number one. And as such, it's that that causes the NADH ratio to build up, which blocks the, the cis aconitate, um, as we saw on the previous chart here. However, that doesn't block the metabolic pathway because it just now starts to go this way. Straight across the oxaloacetate to alpha ketoglutarate pathway. Really quite, really quite brilliant. Okay, so that's fine. It does result in the increase potentially in what they call free radicals or um, really they are, they are, um, potentially so-called damaging um, oxidation products, if you like, but we'll cover that in a minute. All right, so that's that. That is the transport chain. Moving on from there, welcome back. I hope I haven't lost too many of you. All of that being said, that is how, exactly how mechanistically the Randall cycle works. Fat discourages carbohydrate use. Carbohydrate use discourages fat use. Simple as that. Everything else I've said beyond that is just the minutiae. It's just the details of how that happens. What do you need to know? That's what you need to know. Fat blocks out carb. Carb blocks out fat. Don't mix them in your diet. Eat only one of those things with your protein, and the way to decide which one is the one or one of those diets is good for you, the carnivore diet, and one of them is not good for you, the vegan diet. Simple. That's it. That's the take-home message, really. So, that being said, there are a bunch of people running around, and they mostly identify as Raypetians, They're people who believe in some ideas espoused by the late Ray Pete. Um, of which I'm not a fan. Ray Pete did not have a grasp of the basic function, the basic workings of this. And as such, Ray Pete taught his devotees, his followers, several things which are absolutely demonstrably in error. And I'm about to show you what those errors are, just briefly. And they are this. Ray Peteans say, and have said on videos where they're criticizing me, that PDH, pyruvate dehydrogenase complex inhibition, via the buildup of NADH, as described via the blocking of the aconitase enzyme in the Krebs cycle by the FADH2 produced by beta oxidation. Um, what they're saying is that prevents pyruvate from being oxidized, and it's that which actually blocks the sugar. Well, that's false. And why is that false? Well, let's go back two slides. Oxaloacetate to alpha ketoglutarate. Well, look, there's an error here from pyruvate over here. Apologies. <laughs> 
pyruvate, instead of going through the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex to acetyl coenzyme I and then to citrate, which is blocked, pyruvate can bypass the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex entirely via the pyruvate carboxylase reaction and can enter the TCA cycle nonetheless as oxaloacetate. So that's not the cause of the blockade. The cause of the blockade is back at GLUT4. Back here. That's where the blockade is. Not really down here. That's interesting, isn't it? So. Bear with me for a second while I get the color scheme back the way it ought to be. So that's the first error that Ray Pigeons will make. They'll say NADH buildup causes the blockade of glucose at the pyruvate, de uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase complex level. Well, nonsense. Pyruvate can enter the cell anyway, enter the tricarboxylic acid anyway, via going in as, um, as the pathway I've, I've just shown you, the alternate pathway. So that's false. The blockade is at GLUT4. Right, so let's get that right, shall we? Second error made by Ray Petians. They say beta oxidation of fatty acids causes the increase NAD to NADH ratio via the production of FADH delivery of reducing equivalents, the hydrogen atoms, at complex 2 and the coenzyme Q10 level, which I just kind of brushed over before and showed you that's where it's supposed to be. And that is true. It does do that. The argument, however, that Raypetians make is that carbohydrate doesn't do that. Only fat oxidation produces FADH2, which is also false, Raypetians. Sorry about that. Why is it false? Well, it's false because the E3 subunit of the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex of enzymes produces FADH as well. So actually, if pyruvate dehydrogenase activity is occurring, then FADH is entering in the same way it would be were you using fats using beta oxidation. So false again, Ray Petians. Dreadfully sorry about that. Not at all. Ah, right. More errors made by Ray Petians. Free radicals. Oxidating, damaging things. Um, H2O2, for example, is the most powerful one. Caused by the reverse electron transport, which I spoke about with coenzyme Q10 getting bound up and it flowing backwards. Uh, they're saying that's a bad thing. Well, that's false too. H2O2 and such are actually very useful, very powerful signaling molecules. They communicate from the mitochondria back to the cell in such a way as to tell the cell what the energetic state of the mitochondria is and activate various genes that activate various proteins, actually both in the mitochondria and in the cell cytosol as well, in such a way as to be best conduced to the best health and safety and longevity of that cell. Um, universally, saying that free radicals are universally a bad thing and ought to be avoided, not true. Not true at all. False. Okay. Um, it's also a, an error to suggest that the rate limiting step in the tricarboxylic acid cycle, the TCA cycle, is anything other than the succinate to fumarate reaction. For the reason that the succinate to fumarate reaction is actually directly physically coupled to complex 2 coenzyme Q10, thus meaning that the metabolic draw is the thing that, that controls the rate of the TCA cycle. Of course it is. What else, could, what else would drive the TCA cycle faster or slower other than the need to produce energy? So of course that's what it is. Let me just show that to you graphically once again so that you get a handle on what it is I'm talking about there. Um, here it is here. Let me just fix that color scheme for you. Bear with me. Apologies for that. There it is. So I'm talking about the succinate to, uh, to fumarate reaction, the one down here, where you'll see that there's an interaction there with Q, which becomes QH2, or reduced coenzyme Q10. So that is an actual direct 
physical as well as chemical linkage to those proteins bound on that in uh, on that in the membrane of the mitochondria. Only when Q is able to accept H2 will the tricarboxylic acid cycle produce will, will proceed either through its half cycle or more than half, but you know what I mean, there, as I'm showing, or indeed through the whole cycle depending on the fuel sources available. There is your rate limiting step. There. Nowhere else. So anyone that tells you that the rate limiting reaction step in the tricarboxylic acid is anywhere else, like they'll say it's up here, false. No, it isn't. Okay, so hopefully that's absolutely clear and unequivocal for everybody. Right. Um, another error made by others, the cycle is some kind of on or off phenomenon. The Randall cycle, that means, is that it's kind of on or off. No, it's not. Sliding scale. Fat discourages carb, carb discourages fat. The level of discouragement depends on the level of each. So the worst possible diet you can, can consume is one that contains X amount of protein and the rest of your macronutrient equally split between carb and fat. That's the worst diet you can eat in the world. That's the one that will kill you the quickest, absolutely unequivocally. That's the one that will lead you to be chronically systemically inflamed. And inflammation leads to heart disease, atherosclerosis, most forms of cancer, most forms of dementia, diabetes type 2, and probably type 1, as well as all sorts of other um, immune dysfunctions, all the big killers. So stay away from that kind of diet with a mixture of carbs and fat. That's the take-home message, okay? Those are the errors made by others. And that last error is not just a Ray Petian error. It's an error being espoused by a certain psychiatrist who actually doesn't practice as a psychiatrist, who is telling people it's perfectly okay to pour 400 grams of carbohydrates down their neck every day as well as a bunch of fat. It's not okay. Don't do that. That will kill you. And it will age you very, very rapidly in the meantime, as is evidenced by, well, just go and look at the boy and you'll see it for yourself. All right. So the take home messages are as follows. Do not eat a diet which contains a significant amount of both fat and carbohydrates. Get rid of one of those things from your diet. The one you should get rid of is carbohydrates because that's the one you don't need at all. Any of. Um... Separating your carbs and your fat intake by, a, by a several hours, like have one meal that's got carb and one that's got fat, that won't work. That will not alleviate this problem because carb sticks around for about 72 hours. That's why it takes about that long to get into ketosis when you stop eating carbs. Okay, so don't do that. Uh, another real basic message here is don't eat carbs, full stop. Um, at this stage, I thank you very much for your attention. I hope you got something from this. I hope it clarifies the function of this thing for you. Um, questions. Now, Judy's been so kind as to produce some questions. So I'll now enter, I'll answer those questions for you in turn. Here we go. What are my thoughts on carnivore plus fruits and honey? Well, I think I've just covered that one. Under no circumstances should you consume any amount of fruit or honey. None at all. Any amount of fruit and honey will cause a problem every single time you do it, at least for several hours. And if you do that several times a day, well, you do the math. Not a good idea at all. Uh, question number two. Why do some people feel that they can't do carnivore with just meats and fat and no carbs? Are they doing something incorrectly? It's addiction, carbohydrate addiction. Carbohydrates are very addictive. It's both physically and psychologically addictive. If you can't discipline yourself to eliminate carbohydrates from your diet, then you need to speak with my lovely partner, Pim, who specializes in counseling folks on carbohydrate addiction. Her name is Pim, P-I-M, Johnson, J-A-N-S-S-O-N. -S -S and you can email her at Pim at pimjohnson.com and she will help you with your carbohydrate addiction. Uh, the other thing you need to do is make sure that you eat your protein in one whack in, in one meal during the day, not broken up into several meals. Um, 
salt your food to taste absolutely drink water when you're thirsty absolutely and just stay away from those plants and carbs and things all right question three some people look healthy eating clean carbs there's no such thing uh, and carnivore how come they get away with it well everybody has an individual capacity to get away with bad nutritional behavior for a certain period of time but nonetheless it catches up with each one of us at some point if we do the wrong thing and rest assured that consuming any amount of carbohydrate is the wrong thing to do and it will catch up with you sorry about that there are no such thing as clean carbohydrates would be my answer to that one uh, question four carbohydrates tend to have a higher blood sugars or carnivores i'm sorry tend to have a higher blood sugars in the morning yes some say it's because they're not being used in the middle of the night so kind of just sitting in the blood in the am actually a spike in your blood glucose in the morning is normal for everybody it occurs as a function of light hitting your skin it tells your body that the sun is coming up and you need to be ready for your morning activities and as such it will drop a bunch of sugar into your bloodstream in preparation for those morning flurry of activities um, whether the morning phenomenon is higher the spike of blood glucose in the morning is higher in carnivores in an absolute sense is questionable i doubt that it is i don't think that there's any evidence to support that relative to the baseline blood glucose in a mixed diet eater may be true because those people tend to have higher blood glucose levels chronically so the the difference is less but in absolute terms no i don't think so um question five what are some diet rules that seem to work for many on carnivore here we go number one do not change your diet from whatever it is to anything else overnight do not decide i'm going carnivore tomorrow on the basis of having seen this presentation and drop all the carbohydrates that are left in your diet out overnight that is a bad idea that will upset your microbiome almost certainly it will cause some serious problems potentially which may set you back months don't do that remove the carbohydrate that exists in your diet currently slowly and progressively over six to eight weeks in as much of a ramp wise fashion as you can possibly muster it'll take some planning but you need to do that that said absolutely consumer diet which is 100 percent carnivore which contains no plant material of any kind and absolutely certainly not fruit and honey absolutely utterly not under any circumstances um, the same really applies for any plant material there's no place for plants in the human diet whatsoever the place of plants in the human intakes is for medicinal or nutraceutical effect as specifically produced if you like or manufactured nutraceutical extracts and such things which are not there for nutritional purpose they don't contain carbohydrate to speak of they don't contain any fiber to speak of they don't contain plant toxins they are filtered cleaned up things um, that is that in a nutshell so that being said that's pretty much all i had for you today uh, i want to thank you very much for spending this time with me whatever time of day or night it may be for you right now I really genuinely do hope that it was accessible and you got something from it. I'm absolutely happy to answer brief questions from people um, by email if they would like to do that. Of course, you'll have to wait your turn because I get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of emails a week, but I will get back to you at some point. Um, or you can join in with my Q&A sessions, which occur weekly on a Saturday afternoon US time on my fine fine youtube channel where myself and usually one other co-host will answer your questions and we do that live for a couple of hours every week and that's another opportunity for you to interact with us there of course the place to find um, such things you will need to know and what i can do for you is provide you with that information there there it is those are all the places where you will be able to find me and to cyber stalk me thoroughly and see what i'm doing and what i'm saying and to whom i'm saying it and where to join in with the youtube and the ig and the twitter and the facebook so there it all is basically in a nutshell um 
that's what I had for you today. That's my masterclass on the Randall cycle. I hope it clarifies both how the Randall cycle works in practice, why it exists and why it does what it does to protect yourselves from glucose damage, nothing else, and to manage the fuel selection and in so doing protect the cell. Um, that's pretty much what it, why it's there and, and what it does. And also, I hope you've learned from this presentation why it is that all these repeat goons are saying things that are wrong. I hope I've shown where they're wrong exactly. Um, and I hope that you got something from that. All right, that's all. Thank you for joining me. Um, join me across on my YouTube channel any anytime you like, where most likely someone will be wrong because there seems to be a lot of that going on. Thanks very much.